In our last video, we covered electronegativity, the property that tells us how strongly an atom attracts electrons within its bonds. We learned that the more electronegative an atom is, the more it pulls electrons toward itself. But this raises an important question. How exactly do atoms come together to form these bonds? The short answer is when atoms approach each other, their atomic orbitals can overlap if the conditions are energetically and symmetrically favorable. But to explain this more systematically, let's talk about valence bond theory. This theory can give an idea about why some over overlaps are favorable and why some aren't. So let's break it down. Theoretically, any two orbitals can overlap to form a molecular orbital, which is basically a new region of electron density where electrons are shared between atoms. The key to whether a bond forms is whether this overlap creates a lower energy system and stabilizes the molecule. So let's use the simplest example, dihydrogen. Each hydrogen atom has one electron in its 1s orbital. When two hydrogen atoms come together, their 1s orbitals overlap to form a sigma bond, which is a direct overlap of orbitals. This overlap creates a molecular orbital with increased electron density between the two nuclei, which further stabilizes the bond because each positive nucleus has more negative electrons to now interact with. So the energy of the sigma bond is actually lower than the energy of the two isolated hydrogen atoms, making this bond energetically favorable. However, not all overlaps lead to stable bonds. So for example, for every bonding orbital that forms, there's also an anti-bonding orbital. In the case of dihydrogen, if each hydrogen atom had an extra electron or extra electron density that occupied the anti-bonding orbital, this negative charge would cause repulsions like so. And this would lead to increased repulsions between the nucleus because the positive charges are now more exposed. So these orbitals are higher in energy and would destabilize the bond, making it energetically and symmetrically unfavorable. Therefore, these hydrogens with two electrons each would not easily bond. Now let's look at a more complex molecule like carbon dioxide, where carbon has different types of orbitals. These are the electron configurations of each atom involved. We can see that carbon has two unpaired electrons in its p orbitals, and each oxygen has two unpaired p electrons also. Therefore, a p orbital from each oxygen and carbon can overlap without causing this antibonding orbital while creating sigma bonds of lower energy, which stabilizes the molecule. But if we look at the molecule according to the octet rule, it needs to form four bonds in total. So how does it form four bonds considering there are no more unpaired carbon electrons? This is where hybridization comes into play. Essentially, one electron from the lower energy 2s orbital in carbon is promoted to the last available 2p orbital, giving carbon four unpaired electrons, each capable of forming a bond. However, this is not enough because the bonds formed would be unequal due to each of these s and p orbitals having different energy levels. This would lead to an asymmetric molecule uh, with bonds of varying energies re resulting in instability. So to address this, carbon's orbitals undergo hybridization to create new orbitals of equal energy. Carbon combines one s orbital and one p orbital to form two sp hybrid orbitals, each with 50% s character and 50% p character. And a similar process occurs for oxygen, because to form bonds with carbon's sp orbitals, oxygen must also have hybridized orbitals of comparable energy. So this leads to the formation of sp2 hybrid orbitals in oxygen, which I will explain in detail shortly. But for now, these equivalent hybridized orbitals lead to the formation of sigma bonds between the atoms. The two remaining unhybridized p orbitals on carbon can now overlap perpendicularly with the unhybridized p orbitals of oxygen forming two pi bonds. And this arrangement results in a symmetrical linear carbon dioxide molecule that is stable. 
So let's look at another example, ethylene. Each hydrogen atom has one unpaired electron in its s orbital, and each carbon has two unpaired p electrons. And to form four bonds, we need to hybridize these orbitals. So if we were to mix just one s orbital and one p orbital, we would get sp hybridization, resulting in only two hybrid orbitals. But this isn't sufficient to form a symmetrical and energetically favorable molecule, because we would get this. So instead, if we mix one s orbital with two p orbitals, we get sp2 hybridization. This results in three equivalent bonds per carbon, each with approximately 33% s character and 66% p character. So each carbon can form three sigma bonds and one pi bond, creating a structure that is both symmetric and energetically uh, favorable. Now let's look at one last example, methane. Here all four bonds are direct sigma bonds, so we need four equivalent bonds for this molecule to be stable. And you might have guessed it, but to achieve this, that means we need to hybridize all the valence orbitals of carbon, resulting in sp3 hybridization. Each bond then has a mixture of 1s and 3p orbitals, meaning that each bond has 25% s character and 75% p character. And again, we get a structure that makes sense. So to summarize, valence bond theory explains bond formation through orbital overlap, where bonds occur if they are symmetrically and energetically favorable. And it shows that hybridizing orbitals helps us justify how specific bonds form in different molecules. And this gives us the tools to predict or explain why most bonds occur. So that's about it. Thank you for watching. Until next time.